you found the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black. The nation and the league arrive in Las Vegas in 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's Silver and Black Today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. All right, welcome back, Raider Nation. You are listening to The Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio. I'm Scott Gobranson on the air once again. We are 16 days away, ladies and gentlemen, from the return of Raiders football and what should be a better year than last year by all yeah. accounts. But at the same time, you never know. It's a tough schedule. But we have a good show for you today. Just want to let you know what's coming up. We're going to talk about Raiders, what they, what questions they have going into camp, number one. Number two, we're going to welcome Travis Vogan. Travis wrote the book Keepers of the Flame on NFL films, the the, the uh, impact that NFL films has had uh, on the game overall, but also we're going to explore with him not only that from a from a from a fifty thousand foot level, but we're also going to talk to him on what impact it's had on the Raiders brand, right? Uh, and so that's going to be exciting with Travis Vogan. That'll come up after the next break. So make sure you don't go anywhere. Lots of fun to talk about, uh, including the autumn wind, the sable. Uh, father and son ed and steve so we're going to have a great conversations with that want to remind you today's show as always brought to you by the laborers local 872 the men and women building the raiders new stadium here in las vegas we also want to thank mabel's for a great great show yesterday with the saturday sports beat crew and paul eihander out uh, for ufc just an amazing crowd there's a line out the door so that's fantastic Uh, a great spot if you haven't been to mabel's over at palms you should go And uh, always, I am here. I don't do this by myself. I have a capable team, and uh, at least where are they? At least, (laughs) at least most of the time when they're when they're uh, awake and sober. No, uh, that includes Kelly Kreiner. Kelly, how you doing this morning, buddy? I'm good, guys. How we doing here? We're doing fired up for a good show. Yes, as always, and 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 you're you're always fired up, which is which is fantastic. And (laughs) that's because I I don't sleep. Yes, and I know that (laughs) it's funny too because you know we 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 don't deal a lot in in the hater stuff. But I have to say this: Kelly is by far. I'm a lightning rod. (laughs) You're you're polarizing, yeah, man. You get you get a lot of people, and and that's not a bad thing, right? I I I like it because people it means people are listening and paying attention. Right, guys? Yeah. But at the same time, it's always funny, too, what people take issue with you. <laughs> yeah. It's and, really, like, obscure, usually. And, and it's not only that, but it's like like the, they'll be super vehement, vehement on one side about how dumb something I say is. And yet <laughs> every other person on the other side is like, oh, man, that's – like, there's no in-between, man. It's like you <laughs> love it or you hate it. That's It is what it is. Uh, sports. You know? I'm I'm the kind of person I will tell you if you ask my opinion I'll tell you what I think and I don't care which way it goes. As it well, and then uh, our third host here, of course, is the international man of leisure, <laughs> Mr. Chaz Osborne, yep. back from special assignment in British Columbia. And Chaz, I had somebody tell me that they weren't going to listen to our show anymore because Kelly said some negative things about the Lakers, your old employer. Whoa, which was really funny though because it's like. Really, you're not going to listen to a Raiders show anymore because one of the hosts Basketball. was critical of the Lakers. And you probably have to be careful, but the Lakers, you know, hey, they made some questionable moves as of recent. <laughs> Lakers are a dumpster so how, fire. Well, they, they are. And, and, but, but anyway, Chaz, welcome well, we, back. Dude. How, how was British Columbia? Oh, it was great. Yeah, I had some friends uh, invite me up for Canada Day, which is basically Canada's um, Independence Day. So I was hoping to see a game while I was up there. Um, but the I was in Vancouver. The BC Lions were playing in Calgary, so um, but I went over to the um, the BC Lions Stadium, and they have the um, Canadian Hall of Fame in there. You know, they got Wayne Gretzky and um, Steve Nash and all these things. <laughs> but they they have you know the oh, it's Steve a small Nash little is right. He's Canadian, and so but they also have the uh, the BC Lions have their own Wall of Fame. And our uh, good friend of the show, uh, Mervin Fernandez, is on that wall of fame. That it's got all his credentials on there. He was the league MVP up there in '85, and uh, of course, he's going into the, um, you know, Canadian Football Hall of Fame later this summer. So, uh, shout out to Swerve and Mervin. Yes, uh, and that that's that's pretty cool. I think that um, I was going to say, 
does does his does his plaque swerve? Like, ah. is it, because they should put it like on. It's got a like one rack. of those Disneyland things where you move and it kind of moves with like, you, like a hula girl, right? Right. Uh, but anyway, so Chaz Kelly, thanks for being here as always. So okay, guys, so let's let's jump in on a couple things um, to start with, and that includes, I think, the questions the Raiders will have going into camp. As I mentioned, sixteen days away. Some of these questions I want to ask you, these were posed uh, by a, a story up on Raiders.com, so it spurred the thought with me. And I think some of these things, guys, are actually things that we've talked about numerous times on the show here. Uh, so they're not, they're not unusual for us to, to address at all, uh, but, but worthy of, I think, bringing up as we start to think about uh, the team rolling into camp uh, up in Napa coming up here in a few weeks. Which player will take hold and, and really – take the lead on becoming that slot receiver. Right. Who who amongst the Raiders receiving core now, much, I think, improved receiving core, at least um, you add Antonio Brown to any receiving core and suddenly you're, you're in a different league. But what do you guys think? Kelly, wh- what do you think? Who's got the inside track, do you think, before anybody steps on the field, of course, for that slot receiver position? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I am... I'm not a huge fan. Um, I'm totally blanking on Renfro. Hunter. Uh, Hunter, yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, as big a fan of Hunter Renfro as some people are. But, I mean, he's going to be, I think, the easy choice to kind of throw out there because, oh, he catches every ball. He's always open, blah, blah, blah. If you need five, if you need three yards, he'll get you four. If you need nine yards, he'll get you four. I mean, he's got great hands, <laughs> but he's – I just don't see in the NFL, I don't see him getting separation. I don't see him being the kind of guy that you're going to have in your slot. But I think he's going to get the first shot and probably a good chance to take it over. Well, and, and Chaz, I think it's interesting, uh, as as Kelly costs us more listeners because he doesn't like a player. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Our big South Carolina Clemson following going out the window. Oh, well, man. but but here's the thing. Hunter Renfro one of, is one of those guys, Chaz, that always seems to be – there always seems to be a guy, like an underdog guy or a guy who's got talent – it's mid-range talent, like you're, like I think Hunter Renfro has an opportunity in spots, especially in John Gruden's offense, to have the opportunity to make some plays. But as fans, we like the underdogs, right? And so I think with a Hunter Renfro, it's the kind of guy where you th- you maybe think a little too much of him because you're rooting for him as right. a, as an underdog. But w- what what do you think? Is he the guy at slot, or do you think someone else has an inside track there, Chess? Well, that's the fun part about this time of year. You know, everything, it's a clean slate. You know, going into training camps, always that, uh, you know, who's going to shine, who's going to come out of nowhere. You just don't know. He's He's got just as good of a chance as anybody. Um, J.J. Nelson. Um, it's it's all going to shake out, and that's that's the fun part of training camp. You know, it's like the first day of school. Everybody's coming back. The score is 0-0. Everybody's working hard and and, uh, and and fighting for that spot. And it, it's just going to fu- it's going to be fun to see who comes out of it. Like, like we've been talking about all um, – Spring, it's it's um, it's one of those years where you, there's a lot of moving parts, and we're going to find out who fits where and um, who's going to step up. And yeah, um, it, it'll be fun to it'll be fun to watch it shake out. Yeah, and I think I think early on in camp, it's going to be Hunter Renfro. I agree with you, Kelly. I think that's the guy that they've they kind of envision there. We'll see what ends up happening because you either play yourself into a position or you play yourself out of a position. So we'll see where that goes. The next question is. Um, will any Raider running back eclipse the 1,000-yard mark? Uh, and that, of course, brings up the fact that Josh Jacobs still, as you mentioned in the pregame, our pregame show, Kelly, before we go <laughs> on the air, Josh Jacobs is not signed yet. But if when he is signed, I'm going to assume he's going to be signed and it's not going to be uh, yeah. a situation where he's gone. You know, what he's not ha- there. you know what happens when you assume. Oh, I get it. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, But Kelly... In that offense, does he have the possibility of having a thousand yard season as a rookie? I, I mean, if he gets into camp and gets in on time, and he's the starter from day one, he does. Yep. Um, in in that offense, though, I think the ball is going to be spread around a lot everywhere. Um, he you you take you take a guy in the first round, he's going to be your workhorse. But even with that, I mean, Gruden's going to get the other guys the ball. They're going to be throwing the ball around. Uh, but I mean, he's he's definitely got a shot. 
And the thousand yards isn't what it used to be. I mean, it's not, it's not, yeah. it sounds great, but it's 65 yards or whatever a game. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's not a, huge, well, in a spread yeah. offense too, like you said. I mean, they're, they're, it, things are spread out much more. And so running backs, and, and you just don't see the dominating running backs. One question, because we're, we're going to come up here on a break in about a minute and a half. Will the Raiders, Chaz, surrender under 38 sacks in 2019? This means, will their offensive line hold up enough to prevent Derek Carr from going down 38 times? I think they will. I think they're going to be a little more solid this year. Uh, I know there's so many question marks, but um, we've got some good guys in there. <clears throat> I think they're going to come together and um, surprise some people. Including your favorite player, Richie Incognito, well, which brings us to Kelly. Derek Carr gets the ball out so fast. That, uh, that'll be a big part of it. You know, he'll get rid of it before he gets sacked. Sure. Kelly, under 38 sacks? Yeah, I mean, you figure that two and a half a game, that's, I mean, that isn't a huge number. I think they're, I mean, they're going to be right around that. Like, if I'm betting that, I'm probably, I might take the over. <laughs> but, I mean, it's it's, a clo- it, it's, it's, a it's, a, it's a good number to put out yep. there. It is. You know, it is. I mean, you figure, you, you know, you're, you've got Denver, you've got Kansas City, who's, Defense is a little sketchy, but they did get. Right. They do have some pass rush, you know. The Chargers, Chargers, their defensive line stacked. Yep. So I mean, it's you're looking at you know those three. You play those guys twice. The Bears. You know, I was, I was like, what are you going to bring up that? I was like, <laughs> yeah, in the worst games, like yeah, you're going to get destroyed in London, Texas. You know, that could be nine of your thirty-eight right there. <laughs> so I mean, it's. I think we got Minnesota too. Yeah. So when you yeah when you look at it, it's. You know that that number why it might sound kind of high. You figure two and a half a game's not egregious, not right? Yeah, Tennessee, Jacksonville. We do play a lot of good defensive teams this year. All right. Well, we're up on our first break. Thanks for all the discussion, guys. When we come back, we're going to explore and celebrate the 90th birthday weekend of the Raiders mastermind and the NFL Maverick, and that, of course, is Al Davis. You're listening to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. found the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black this is silver and black today live on cbs sports radio 1140 here's your host scott gobranson Welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio. Of course, the music. Let's keep that up a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Why don't we have that every show? So, uh, of course, sound courtesy of NFL Films and the great Sam Spence. Yep. Which in the next, uh, after the next break, I should say, we're going to be talking to Travis Vogan, who wrote the book, Keepers of the Flame, that, uh, of course, that music comes from NFL Films. But we're back. We're going to talk with him after the break and uh, learn about that. What we wanted to do here, though, was really talk about uh, Al Davis. Of course, Al Davis, born on the 4th of July, or as I call it, Independence Day, because that's its real (laughs) name. Uh, But nonetheless, born on the 4th of July, 1929, Brockton, Massachusetts, would have been 90 years old this week. Of course, uh, Mr. Davis passed away in 2011 the architect of the Raiders franchise, the man who went from a scout to an assistant coach to a head coach to general manager to league commissioner of the AFL, albeit for two months, to owner. The only man to ever do that, by the way, guys. Uh, But we want to just talk a little bit about uh, Al Davis and remember him on his birthday. And guys, I mean, I think that when you think about Al Davis, a lot of people alive uh, probably have some memories of him towards the end of his life which yeah. is a much different era for him uh but it's unfortunate it's al davis is mostly known for his last 15 years of existence probably you know for having a revolving door of head coaches and multiple lawsuits uh, against the nfl and um you know trading head coach john gruden to tampa bay and of course drafting jamarcus russell with the number one overall pick but you know uh, most casual fans and recent aver- observers don't know Al was a, a visionary and he was extremely diligent. You know, he was active in civil rights. He he hired, you know, the first African-American coach, the second um, Latin coach, the first female 
chief executive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Al Davis helped construct the NFL into the colossus that it is today, basically. Well, and Chaz, I mean, you, you talked about it. Uh, Tom Flory is the first, actually, minority coach, right? Well, um, I think New Orleans Saints had a Latino coach in seven early 70s for a few years. Well, but to your point, though, I think when you when you think about Al Davis uh, and his contribution to the game, he isn't, of course, in the Hall of Fame because he should be. Yeah. Uh, and and one of the things too that I find remarkable in in, in preparing for the NFL film segment we're going to be doing uh, coming up here uh, after the break is the fact that how much he really had to do with the way the NFL changed. I mean, and in fact, him and three people that he was associated with over the years, especially early in those AFL days, including Sid Gilman, Mm -hmm. um, they really changed the game. You talk about the vertical game. Al Davis wanted to go vertical. He wanted to do all these things. But it was, I think, more than anything, how he treated people. Yep. Al Davis was not a popular figure because he didn't he wanted to win. He had a way of doing it. He could be abrasive. He was honest and straightforward. Not everybody liked that, especially when you were talking about a here's a guy who's bumping his way into a league full of billionaires uh who were who were owners of these teams. So people like Tech Schram didn't like Al Davis. No, they're old school, kind of straight laced, right. you know. And and so Al doesn't get enough I know, you know, you look at kind of like a Joe Namath, somebody that He's kind of looked at as somebody that kind of changed the culture of the NFL and brought in this young swagger. But you got to give Al Davis and John Madden a lot of credit, you know, for for letting their players be individual. I think that's a lot of the reason why a lot of the Raider fans are fans today, because in the seventies, these guys, you know, they were characters, and Madden and Al Davis allowed them to be care. You know, they didn't care as long as they showed up to play on Sundays. You can go out and do whatever you want and be a character. That's right. And in fact, we have a, a clip here. This is from Al Davis's Hall of Fame acceptance speech. This is number two, David Stepani and our engineer. Uh, Here's Al Davis talking about that philosophy and how he treated people within the Raider organization. I learned early on in life that if you're going to lead, if you're going to dominate, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, is not necessarily right. You must treat people in a paramilitary situation the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated. To do that, you must learn about them learn their cultures, and allow for their individual differences. We never wanted our players, or even our friends, to fit into rigid personality molds. There's a place in this world for mavericks, stand up for principle, defy custom at times, be right, do not hurt others. That individualism encouraged me to go forward, and my heroes, my heroes when I was a young boy, dared me to dream. Well, there you go. There's Al Davis from his Hall of Fame acceptance speech. And guys, a, a Kelly specifically here on this one, you know, Al Davis talking about treating players they want to be trained, learning cultures. Of course, that means, and, and as Chaz mentioned, Al Davis really w- one of the first uh, people in the NFL to, to welcome uh, African-American players to go out and scout them because he didn't care what color you were, where you came from. He just wanted to win. Uh, but, Kelly, that culture, you know, we're still dealing with issues we dealt with back then as it comes to uh, people and, and color and culture and everything from the Kaepernick thing to other things related to uh, social issues in the NFL, Kelly. But Al Davis was there, and that speech right there, what he said, is why I think the Raiders continue to have that legacy. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. And. There's always going to be issues like that. I mean, it's, people are just going to, you know, people are always going to be different. They're just going to, you know, but in the think that Al started that, and that's not, like, that should be the first and foremost thing we think of with the Raiders organization. Think of Al Davis. And, of course, it isn't, you know, and that's right. the unfortunate part of it is because everything else, like you said, the last 15 recent years, memory. all the stuff goes, just overshadows that because it's just a recency bias. We, you know, we remember the last thing we see more than we do the profound things and stuff that were going and, on. And, and, and you're right about the recency bias. I think that it, it's remarkable. And if you haven't read about Al Davis and, and watched the documentaries and all that to understand his impact on the league and the game, because remember – First and foremost, he really considered himself a coach, right? He was always a coach. That's when Hugh Jackson got fired, right? He said, I love this because I'm talking to a man who's a coach. I can actually talk X's and O's with this guy. Um, And a mentor. And and a mentor. And what he was saying in that that clip, 
you know, how, how he gets to know people's personalities. You know, all these other owners just kind of viewed these players as assets, but Al got to know you. And, and a lot of you hear a lot of these players when they talk about Al kind of as a father figure and going a little deeper than just, you know, get out there and play for me. And, and, and the whole point in his speech about being a maverick, uh, I relate to that too, having gone uh, to UNLV and, and, and grown up during the Tarkanian era. He had the same kind of reputation in college basketball, which took on uh, a life of its own. But he, he did the same thing. He gave guys second chances. Uh, a lot of times, a couple times it really burned him. One cost him his job, really. But at the same time, Al Davis, Al Davis also embraced the bad guy image. He didn't care if you thought he was bad. He wanted to intimidate. He thought mentally if you intimidated the opponent, you could win. It would give you a distinctive advantage. Yeah. And, and in his Hall of Fame speech, he tells a story about a Raider fan, which we'll, <laughs> we'll, we got to play this. It's about a minute or so, but go ahead and play uh, number three for me there. Yep. Aside from my will to win and my commitment to excellence, I want to read just a few things to you that happened recently that I thought you'd get a kick out of. This gentleman here, Claude Jones, is a famous bank robber. 24 banks that he robbed, but he's also the greatest Raider fan in the world. I just want to read a few words of his to you. The psychologist said that the problems that his led to his crime spree were deep-rooted and more complex than raid a passion gone astray. Though his crimes were trying to seek revenge against everyone who turned on him, the raiders through it all remain loyal. I robbed 24 banks I didn't have anything left, but there was always hope with them. Jones plans to write Raider Onda Al Davis a letter of apology. I've embarrassed the team, he said. I would tell him that I lost control. It was my fault. I robbed banks to go to Raider games, but the Raiders didn't tell me to rob banks. I should have finished school, got a better job, and made enough money to pay for myself. Jones hopes Davis will understand. I also wish I could hire his lawyers. In the end, he said that my commitment to excellence, this is Jones, my dream when I get out of prison is to go to work for the Raiders. I'd like to do anything for them. I'd like to do anything constructive. The only thing I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do their banking. All right, Al Davis. Their banking. <laughs> Al Davis. <laughs> want to remember him on what have, would have been his 90th birthday here on July 4th. We're going to step aside when we come back. Travis Vogan. The history of NFL films and what place it added. What, what, I can't even, I'm speechless. What, uh, <laughs> what contribution did it have to build the Raiders' iconic brand? You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Hey, this is Eric Allen. You're listening to Silver and Black today. Special game, a unique game, played nowhere else on earth. It is a rare game. The men who play it make it so. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Coming now, buddy. We on our horse all day long. Let's just kick that ball all day long. Pick it up. Don't stop. Pick it up. Let's go. Let's get after the ball. Catch somebody. Like a leader. All right. We're coming. Of course. The famous music of NFL Films. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. That is going to be our subject. We're having a little bit of a technical issue with our phones. We're going to get to those, and Travis Vogan will join us uh, very shortly to talk about that. Uh, But, guys, I mean, if we look at NFL Films, let's talk first in general about NFL Films because uh, for most of us, I think, even, even for younger generations, so people under the age of 30 even, you've seen the work of NFL films, right? Because, I mean, for me growing up in the 70s and 80s, it was such a, a, a huge part of me getting to know the NFL, getting to love the game. Uh, was it the same for you guys? And, and what, what was your kind of your biggest memory when it came to NFL films? Well, the biggest thing for me was like, you didn't really know. You didn't know that you were watching NFL film stuff, right? But you would just see like on sports channels, on TV shows, on HBO. 
you would just see these little packages and see little things like that. Working out. And then you would realize later that, oh, hey, NFL Films did that. Right. And we you didn't know? care. We just but, wanted the more football yeah. we're watching, the better. For a lot of people don't real like, if you know, for the last 20 years where NFL's been you know, the number one sport and everything, 30, 40 years ago, it wasn't like that. Right. So NFL Films was really the only way you could get kind of like highlight so packages and things like that. In. Right. And you're getting extra footage, right? Because... Now you're watching you're watching the games on the weekend, but back then you know we only had two three channels, and you only yeah. got a, you only got your one game, and you, there wasn't a Sunday night game, there wasn't a Thursday night game, right? So now you're getting all this extra footage, like the Saturday morning ABC special and uh, these other things, and, and then uh, you know any extra football you could get was just a bonus. So NFL Films, you know, bringing that, yeah, and. The great thing is, like, they're the only ones that have, like, the old footage of stuff that nobody really – because nobody was recording and saving all this stuff because right. tape was so expensive back in the day. You would record yeah. over stuff after yeah. a certain point. Yeah. So if it wasn't for the NFL Films Library, there's just so much of this old stuff that we never would have been able that to see. That was one of the things I wanted to ask Travis when he comes on is, like, is there just a a, a mile oh, – no, yeah, the, Their warehouse. Their warehouse yeah. must just be filled with old tape footage, yeah. like, as far as the eye can see – they miles. Yeah, they've got stuff all the way back to like the early 1900s of just old, just film stock of different right. stuff. But yeah, it's. I mean, they've got a they've got a literal library of just all this old film, and it's stuff that if it wasn't for NFL films, we would never have been able to see. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I just uh, any 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 football I could get when we were younger because you know it was only on on Sundays and then Monday night. So any extra football you could get was a bonus. Now you, you, you can't. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say, we, we uh, just an update. We are going to have Travis on. We're having an issue here in the studio with the phones. So we're going to delay Travis's appearance here uh, until after the next break, and then we'll carry him through the top of the hour. So I want to just, I know we just talked about NFL films. I want to hold that discussion for a minute uh, and, and talk a little bit about, um, about media in general. We talk about uh, the the NFL films and how we it was so important for us growing up to kind of to, to 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 get to know the game that way and 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 how it's changed now we look at the media we we just saw another weekend where the NBA dominated this time again I agree with Kelly it's more exciting during the off season <laughs> than during the regular season but the way the NFL films now it's such a highlight culture Kelly everything is in like thirty second blurbs. So when you think about NFL films and that long form, the drama, I mean, those were pieces of art. They were film. They were not highlights on NFL Network or highlights on ESPN or ABC. They were really movies. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's sad that, you, like you said, with the way nobody wants to spend that 15 or 20 minutes watching things like that. And it's the same, it's the same thing with long form written stories. Right. You know, you don't have reporters spending two weeks with a player or somebody anymore and then writing this long piece. Right. It's an afternoon. It's a five or six paragraph. You know, it's. We wait for their tweets now. Yeah. It's, it's even, just, we want, we want, you know, we want an appetizer. We don't want a meal. Right. And, you know, you can't talk about NFL films and not acknowledge the voice of God, John Facenda, <laughs> right? John, no. the frozen tundra. I mean, he gave us, you know, he. He narrated the autumn wind. It, it, the chance meeting, I know we're going to talk with Travis about it, and, and uh, he'll tell us a story, I think, about how Ed and John Facenda met. But just that voice going along, and, and of course with, with Sam Spence's music, all of that, just the marriage of all of those things, that cocktail that just brewed up perfectly, it just, it, it just uh, it gives you chills thinking about it because without his voice, without that music, and without that slow-motion footage of Willie Brown cruising down the sidelines, taking the, right? taking the the, the uh, interception back for yeah, the touchdown. Just, yeah, and, and that's poetry. it. And again, just a just an update. We we had a technical issue here in the studio. We will be bringing you Travis Rogan, uh, Vogan, excuse me, from uh, the book NFL Films, uh, a book about NFL Films, in a minute. So we were throwing a little curveball here, but so we're kind of moving some of the discussion we we're going to have after the after the interview up to now. But guys, I think you're right about Facenda. But also Steve Sable. Now, Ed Sable founded it as father, of course, and we'll get into that backstory in a few minutes. Right. But Steve Sable is the one who wrote it all. So Autumn Wind, the poem that is the Autumn Wind, because that's what it is, yep. is Steve Sable. And unfortunately, uh, Steve passed away in 2015 after battling uh, brain cancer. Um, but Steve also was the, 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 the cinematographer. He was the guy who wrote all of that and really was the driving force behind so much of it. 
uh, that that he brought his father's vision to life mm-hmm. and really had the creativity. And and you just don't see that. Th- this is not be 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 smirging anybody out there who does video now because it's amazing the kind of highlights you get in the slow motion all these oh, yeah. computer aided stuff which is cool the angles and the cameras they have now. oh yeah to watch the game at the same time though do we get the same depth guys of the stories and the drama that that really built football into what it is today that's the only question because it's so instant just like everything else mm-hmm. i feel like we're missing something yeah oh i agree with that too but nobody wants that anymore they want the instant stuff. i want it it's Yep. It's the the instant gratification. The instant <laughs> gratification is what people want. Like I said, you don't you don't need that depth of you know depth of a story. You don't need, and right. especially now because you know with fantasy football gambling and everything like that, mm-hmm. that's what really draws in your casual fan to be a bigger NFL fan. If you're already an NFL fan, you're there. Right. You know yeah. you're not there. It, you're not. Oh, I'll watch a game every now and then. Blah blah blah. It's you're either in or you're kind of out. So you don't need that that storytelling. You don't need that arc to kind of draw yeah, people. There's so in. much so much coverage now. You know, back in the day, we I, I'd wait for the George Michael sports, sports machine, machine. with the big that? buttons, man. Late, yeah, with the big button, late Sunday night, and then of Cincinnati, course, here we come, boom, and then, button. And then Thursday night was the HBO would re, you know do the inside the NFL, so you had to wait for Thursday. Also produced by NFL Films, by the way. That's right. So yeah. you know now everything's instant. You've already seen every highlight fifteen times before Sunday's even over. I can watch every football game on my phone for eighty nine bucks <laughs> a year on the NFL app. No, but right. that's, but that's true. So so we've kind of given up some. And I and hey, we could we could make this co- a correlation to news and a lot of other things too. It's it's instant delivery, instant gratification, instant news. And so you don't get some of that storytelling. And to me, maybe it's because I have a background as a writer and all that. I want the story. And the way the NFL films did it back in the day, and it has changed. Hey, look, things change. They don't always stay the same. And so you have to kind of just deal with it. But when you go back and you watch some of those old films, to me, currently watching A Football Life, which airs on NFL Network, which is produced by NFL films and shot on film, Still, it's not, or it's video, but it's meant to look like film. Um, that itself is is dis- distinguishes itself from something because you're telling a longer form story. Uh, at the end of July, we're actually going to have Roy Firestone on the yeah. show to talk about uh, his his interactions with some Raiders and his career as a, 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 an interview an interviewer on TV. But his show, if you remember, up close, I grew up watching that oh, yeah. too on ESPN. And he says it, you know, the longer form interview, the longer form of anything is kind of gone. Um, does it have a place? I, I agree with him. I think it does. But in the way of NFL films, there's so much going on, so many things happening that I just don't ever see that, that type of storytelling coming back, guys. No, you're right. Yeah, I, I don't see it coming back either. Wright Thompson does it for ESPN like three times a year, and his pieces are some of the best stuff you will ever read. Right. But like I said, it's three or four times a year because it's not something people want anymore. And it's sad because yeah. there, there's an art to having a story develop over, even if it's just three or four pages about something like that, right. to where now it's like if it's not in three paragraphs, yeah, nobody reading wants it. it. Painting yeah. a picture of the whole thing. Now you just go on Twitter and you get it in an instant and you're done. Move well, on to and, the next. And, and that's true. And I, but I do want to add that at the same time, as Kelly mentioned, for ninety dollars a year, you can watch games on your phone. So when you're out, if like sometimes I was at my kids' flag football game and I just wanted to keep track of the score, and during halftime I would be able to catch up on a game. Right, that is awesome. It, so, so the, the the technological advances, the delivery of media in new ways, also to me offers an amazing opportunity for us to to keep in touch with football much more. So there's the positive side of that too, uh, but the storytelling piece. Um, I, I miss a lot. I miss those guys. I miss the writing, the crispness, the the use of words to really hammer home those things is yeah, incredible. They just paint a picture. It's beautiful. They do. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to step aside. Hopefully, we'll get our phone issues worked out here during the break or shortly thereafter. And then we'll welcome Travis Vogan, who wrote the book, Keeper of the Flame, about NFL films. You're listening to Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. The only 
way to take Silver and Black today with you is with the Radio.com app. Download it today and search CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas and listen to us anytime, anywhere. Oh, yes. Welcome back. We are calling audibles today due to some technical issues. Stay tuned for Travis Vogan, who's going to talk with us about the impact of NFL films on the iconic Raiders brand and, of course, on the NFL overall because it has had a huge impact on the brand and helping the brand that is the NFL, the National Football League, and we want to make sure that we talk to him. So don't miss that one. It'll be coming up here shortly. We have um, our executive producer, Mark Bonilla, on his way to fix things because he is a brilliant, brilliant guy. Anyway, I want to get to, before we hit the top of the hour, some NFL news to share with you. Uh, Not all of it good, of course, and that is uh, former New England Patriots linebacker, Super Bowl champion Teddy Bruschi suffered a stroke on Thursday but was home from the hospital the next day. Uh, It looks like he is doing okay. Second stroke for the 46-year-old Bruschi, who won three Super Bowls with the team that all Raiders fans absolutely love, and that's the Patriots. A statement released Friday morning stated that Bruschi had a transient ischemic attack and immediately recognized the warning signs, arm weakness, face drooping, and speech difficulties. And guys, I mean, it's crazy when when you think about an athlete like that, and now he's retired. The guy's in really good shape. I see him on TV all the time. To have a stroke, a second stroke at 46 years old. Yeah, amazing. He had one during his playing career, right? And he yeah. came back to play a few months later. Yeah, it's insane. So uh, uh, our thoughts out to Teddy Bruschi and his family. Hopefully he recovers uh, quickly. Also, bad news out of Miami. Defensive lineman Kendrick Norton was involved in a serious car wreck early Thursday morning that resulted in the amputation of his left arm. Jeez. Yeah. <clears throat> According to the Florida Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles, at approximately 1.18 a.m., Norton was driving uh, on State Route 30, 836. His vehicle, for unknown reasons, crashed into a concrete barrier okay. and overturned. Uh, impairment was not ruled an issue here, guys. Uh, and you got to wonder maybe if he fell asleep or whatever. But here's a 22-year-old player who was drafted in the 18 dra- draft in the seventh round by the par- uh, Panthers and then cut and now signed with the Dolphins in December. But... 22 years old to lose your arm he's trying to make a team just a terrible break for him yeah well both those stories this goes to show you know you gotta live life to the fullest you never know what could happen yes and uh ezekiel elliott remember him guys what team is he on he's Uh, on the cowboys right ezekiel elliott uh met issues an apology after he met with commissioner roger goodell in new york on tuesday to discuss a may incident where vegas can you imagine a team in Las Vegas? See how much trouble guys oh, are going to get man. in when they're in Las Vegas? I hate that narrative. It's so it's such crap. <laughs> We're going to be the top but, team. I know I'm contradicting myself because this happened in Vegas, guys, but well, it can I, happen anywhere. I can't remember who it was, but somebody said if you're rich and famous, you can get in trouble anywhere. Yeah. And that's, I mean... Well, we were talking about the arrests earlier before the show. That's right. Those weren't all in Vegas. No, and we're going we're gonna to get into that a little later when we welcome Michael Troiano, our legal expert, uh, as well. But Ezekiel Elliott issued an apology of his off-the-field conduct via Twitter. Jeez. Following yeah, there the it is. conclusion of the meeting. Here's your news. And here's what Elliott yeah. said. I've worked hard to make better decisions and to live up to the high standards that are expected of me. I failed to do that here, and I made a poor decision. The meeting between Elliott and Goodell was preceded by an incident uh, where the running back had a confrontation with a security guard at EDC, which is here in Las Vegas, the Electronic Daisy Carnival. Yes. Oh, boy. That was great. Elliott was briefly detained but never arrested. And and basically, guys, he kind of just got mouthy with a a security guard who then placed him in handcuffs, uh, didn't arrest him. Uh, and it was over pretty quick. I saw that video. It didn't look like it was anything. No, yeah, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I didn't think it was that big of an issue. I mean, he's just being a a hole, right. <laughs> which okay. That any kind of you're at concert and stuff like yeah, that. Have the people you have, there. A, you have 130,000 people out there. Gonna Somebody's so, that's going to happen. It just so happens that he's famous and somebody right. had a camera. So no. I was reading here about this um, this story about um, the Hall of Fame, and um, they're talking about. In 2020, they might enshrine 20 new members, and uh, they're talking about a lot of ex Raiders having a shot of getting in there. So, so what is this 20? Why, why 20? I guess it's the 2020 is the number, right? What's the normal uh, number? And it's usually? the 100th anniversary of the league, too, right? Yeah. And so the normal well, they number put a hundred people in. <laughs> I mean, they, don't they do that every year? Well, the 
the NFL Hall of Fame is not nearly as bad as the Basketball Hall of Fame. If you've ever shot a basketball, one day you will be enshrined <laughs> in the Basketball Hall of Fame. But 20 people at once getting ridiculous. Well, as long as they shorten their speeches, right? You can't, everybody good, can't have good, a 20 remember, remember, the NFL created the Hall of Fame. It is a league-driven. It's not independent like the Baseball Hall of Fame. It, I mean, it's run. It has its own board and all that stuff. But it is run by the NFL. And so it's not surprising. I've always thought that too many people get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I know right. the rosters are big, and there's a lot of great players, and there's a lot of great players. You're mentioning the Raiders who are not in there, Cliff Branch, Bill Tom Piano. Flores, Plunkett, Villapiano, all these guys. Yep. At the same time, if you're going to do 20 at a time, are you setting a precedent now that you're going to have to do more and more and more every year? And then how many speeches is that, right? That's what I'm saying. Uh, Cut uh, down the speeches. But you, you can't, I mean... You gonna you gonna try to Oscars people off and start playing the music and stuff <laughs> over them? Give them Guess the hook. what? Those guys aren't leaving. No, right. they're like I blood, sweat, and tears on a field for this day. Right. You're not. Yeah, say like you get like just say like a, a Ray Lewis or a Strahan. You gonna try to go up there and pull him off stage? No. That ain't happening. <laughs> no, and some of those some of those guys even at their advanced uh, age. Are pretty dang tough. Still like, take us. Yeah, they they could still take you, Kelly. Yeah, I'm talking to you because I think I think you'd mouth off to them. <laughs> no, uh, I'm, well, I mean, if they gave me a reason to, I might, but I don't really see that being an issue. <laughs> What's the normal number? Well, it's usually what seven or eight players they kept. Uh, it, I was like, it's usually right around. I was thinking it was right around six, like seven, six or seven. Kinda, yeah, yeah, but, six or seven. And but then the other thing too, I want to just make a gripe real quick, guys. When when they when they put someone in posthumously after they've passed away, right. Why don't they give a ring and a jacket to the family? What is the deal with that? Why are they? Why would they not allow the family to enjoy the moment for the person since they're gone? Correct. I think that's the big um, topic of conversation with uh, Ken Stabler right now. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it has been since he was put in. It was first of all they should have put him in before he passed away. Yeah, huge mistake, of course. But then why not give? I mean, look at recent guys who've been who passed away who were given the honor like Junior Seau and others right. and Stabler. And they don't get. How do you not give that to the family? Right. I I can kind of see them not doing the speech thing up there speech for somebody. Although I get, they, yeah, they like do saying it. they do do that. But I mean, yeah. I could kind of see that's where they're. But right. yeah, it's a ring and a jacket. Yeah, yeah. It it takes you no time to have that stuff made, uh, and it's just. I mean, just for the goodwill and the. I mean, this this should be a non issue. It's a right. no brainer, and the fact that they're drawing a line there. It just makes no sense. Yeah. It doesn't. We're going to step aside for the top of the hour sports update from CBS Sports. And when we come back, we're hopefully going to be joined by Travis Bogan to talk to us about NFL films. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. You found the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black. The nation and the league arrive in Las Vegas in 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's silver and black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back to the silver and black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. As the lights are being jammed up for some reason. I don't know what's going on. As I'm now glowing on screen if you're watching us on video. Uh, welcome back to the show. We've had to call audibles here. We've been under center and barking out on the line as we've had some technical issues. But that's okay because when, when, when you need somebody to come in the game and win the game for you, yeah. there's nobody better in town, especially when it comes to any issues you have around criminal defense that, of course, is our good friend and sponsor here on the Silver and Black today, and that is attorney Michael Toronto, who I haven't seen in a while. He's been a little busy uh, doing all kinds of national TV. Michael, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me back. All right. He's, he's, uh, he's uh, celebrating a wedding anniversary. Congratulations on that. And you have a child on the way. Exciting times, man. A lot going on. <laughs> and, and you're making sure uh, people either stay out of jail, hopefully they – or – you're getting them the best defense they can have, which is fantastic. So we wanted to bring Michael on and talk a little bit about some of the things we're seeing out in the NFL. It's actually been somewhat slow when it comes to uh, NFL 
arrests and all that, which is great for the league. Yeah. Uh, none of the Raiders have had any trouble, which is fantastic as well because we cover them here on the show. But, Michael, when you look at some of the things that we have looked out there, Ezekiel Elliott, we mentioned it in the last segment, but Ezekiel Elliott's here. He's at EDC, which is known for all sorts of illicit drugs and all that kind of thing that go along with the electronic music. Um, Ezekiel Elliott doesn't get arrested, but it makes news. And the NFL can hold things against him, of course, because we know they have their own rules. But when you look at the Ezekiel Elliott situation, uh, how often are you seeing, even when people maybe either have criminal charges or they don't, uh, that employers overall, how much are employers learning about people's activities outside of work? Is it an issue for people when it comes to criminal issues? Well, I think it really depends on uh, their status or what exactly their occupation is. Obviously, if you're a famous athlete in any sport, especially the NFL, the spotlight is on you. And today with social media, anybody can be a reporter, take a picture, post it up uh, instantly. So for you know, regular Joes out there, most likely if they're smart enough not to post their own drama <laughs> on Facebook or social media. A lot of people media, aren't. That is true. That is true. Uh, then it's not something that uh, you know I see for the average uh, guy and gal. How yeah. about the, uh, I was wondering about the Tyreek Hill case. I know they have some audio of him um, threatening his fiance and, and uh, discussing using a belt on his son. How, how do you see that one playing out? I think actually the last time I was here that we got into that Talked discussion. It, yeah, yeah I, um, it's it's feel like it's been quite like you said, it's been a quiet summer. Not right. a lot has gone on. I haven't quite honestly heard really any updates from either yeah. end of that. Well, one, one of the things they, they've said, uh, they, they did not bring charges, Michael, uh, against him. Uh, the, the prosecutors didn't pursue charges against him. So even though there's audio tape and, but we know, and I know you have uh, experience defending folks where sometimes things look one way and they're not that way. Or there's sometimes, Michael, there's just not sufficient evidence. That doesn't mean the person's not perhaps ha- didn't do something wrong, but if you don't have evidence, you can't prosecute them. Right. Absolutely. We still have due process in this country and you're, you're correct. There could be something that was done wrong, illegally, immorally, whatever you want to call it. And there's not sufficient evidence to bring charges. Unfortunately, the reality is it's usually the opposite end of that. Everyone rushes the judgment. It sounds horrible at first. Right. And then we actually lay down the facts and see what exactly we're dealing with. And that's the way that I kind of explain to my clients when they come into the office for the first time. They're extremely anxious, upset. They've got a horrible accusation against them. And it's troubling times, but what I like to lay out to them is, hey, it's like playing poker, but the good news is they have to show us their cards first before we decide how we're going to play our hand. Right. Well, and that's the other thing, too, is you talked about people rushing to judgment. Uh, and because because someone like Tyreek Hill, for example, and Ezekiel Elliott, even though he didn't end up getting arrested, and it looks like he's not going to get suspended from the NFL either, they have a history. And so when you have a history, now, if, if you're just Joe Schmo and I've never done anything, I've never been on the wrong side of the law, that's one thing. Uh, but when you have repeated history, the, the court of public opinion is going to be tough to overcome, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And especially when you have an issue that comes up that's in the same, quote unquote, family tree where uh, Ezekiel was previously accused of uh, battery, domestic violence. I don't believe this issue was exactly uh, domestic in nature, but a physical violent charge. Uh, unfortunately for him, it didn't rise to that specific level. But of course, when somebody has a past accusation just alone, mm-hmm. that in and of itself is going to be problematic in the court of public opinion. Well, and Michael, the one one thing that we did see from a month ago was uh, Buffalo Bills rookie linebacker Tyler Dotson uh, from Texas A&M. Um, $10,000 accused of stealing that from his girlfriend's apartment along with uh, some domestic violence. We we talk about all this time. I, I don't have any patience for domestic violence. Like, you know, if you are found guilty of domestic violence, then I, you have no sympathy from me. But we're also seeing over and over again um, false accusations and all that kind of stuff. Um, when when you encounter somebody who's either accused of, of domestic violence or something similar um, – if somebody's out there, what, what do they need to know? Is it is it when you're in a situation where things get hot, it's just get out of there, leave immediately so that you're not falsely accused or it doesn't rise to the occasion where you might do something because people get emotional? Uh, that's absolutely a great piece of advice is if it's getting heated to the point where you even think it might get physical, it's, it's time to leave. I mean, you were speaking earlier about uh, people with domestic violence charges or being found guilty and not having tolerance for that. And, and I agree and I respect that. But 
it's any simple or offensive touching is a battery and there's a domestic relationship. I had a client, wow. true story here in Las Vegas, that she was actually charged in Henderson where she found some text messages that she necessarily uh, didn't necessarily like on her boyfriend's phone. And her violent act was pouring a room temperature glass of white wine on him. Mm. And he knew the game, which is usually the first one to call wins. And he called Henderson police and they arrested her and charged her and put her in jail for domestic violence. Fortunately, we were able to come to a plea deal and get that dropped. Uh, But technically under the law, that's a battery. And that's a domestic battery because they were in a dating relationship. And that's alcohol abuse on top. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and, and Michael, you look at the NFL. I, I looked up some statistics because we're coming off of the 4th of July. Unfortunately, right down in my neighborhood in Southern Highlands, we saw an impaired driver cause a horrific five-car accident. And people are still drinking and driving. Um, so we want them not to first. We, we, we'd we love them to use you for, for, for legal issues. But at the same time, if we can keep DUI off the roadway. In the NFL, the largest crime committed by players over the last 20 years is DUI. There's been uh, 224 DUI charges uh, against NFL players. Drugs was number two, 107. Domestic violence, third with 101. In today's society, let's say you do make the mistake of getting behind the wheel, and hopefully, by the grace of God, you don't hurt someone else or yourself. Um, what do you do if, if you do get behind the wheel and you find yourself in a situation where you're pulled over or you just maybe you're driving and you realize, you know, I shouldn't be, I need to pull over and do something – what do people need to know legally uh, about that situation and getting into that situation? Well, like you said, you hope in today's day and age they learn to call right, or yeah. Lyft or an Uber, use their app on their phone, friends like that. And and I try to explain it to people like this. It's it's almost to the point of zero tolerance. People think .08 BAC is, is some high number. It quite honestly is not. It's next to nothing. Mm-hmm. So I just tell people, hey, if you're going to have a drink – don't don't drive. That that's where we're at, and I quite honestly believe that more and more states are going to get to that point. Um, but if you are pulled over and you did have a drink, or you're accused of having uh, a drink, or like right now with marijuana being legalized, that's uh, a lot more of a pre- prevalent issue. Uh, I tell people to just kind of accept their fate. You're going to be arrested. You're going to jail. It's happening. Sure, everyone has that buddy who tells this great story about how they got out of it and got away. <laughs> but quite honestly, you've just got to keep your mouth shut and, and let me do my job. Because the more you say, the more you admit, the more you lie or try to defend yourself, it's all on body cam now. Yes. All on body cam. And we play it and we go to court. And I've had cases that quite honestly were going to be fantastic for us from a defense point of view. And then you watch the body cam and, and the video and, and the client just destroys any chance that they had at a positive well, resolution. Well, people feel bad about doing the wrong thing, so they tend to talk, right? Uh, it seems like that, that to me, people always over talk. Um, because they feel bad about something, so they're showing some remorse. That does not help your defense. Well, I've watched thousands of DUI videos <laughs> over the year, and uh, it's typically not remorse. It's how can I get myself out of this situation, ah, and, I, and I'm the smartest person in the room. <laughs> and, it, and it's human nature. I, I get it. Yep. Uh, yeah. But you, you got to fight against that. If you found, find yourself in that position, you're going to go to jail. You're going to get bailed out or get what we call an OR recognizance uh, release, and then hopefully you're going to make the next phone call to my office. Yeah, absolutely. And check out TreyanoVegasLaw.com, by the way. Uh, Michael is one of the best in the business, and so if you do find yourself in that situation or more serious matters or someone you know or family, reach out to TreyanoVegasLaw.com. Give him a buzz. Well, some legal fun before we let you go, Michael. Fun? I love um, fun. Okay. <laughs> what team over the last 19 years, and, and Raider fans will love this one, what team has had the most arrests? I mean, just, Take to, a look, wild guess. just to look in your eye, it's going to be the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> no, it's not no? the Steelers. Oh, okay, I thought you were just doing <laughs> yeah. that to mess with me because that's my, my home team or, Mike, yeah, <laughs> or my yeah. family's home team. I'm from Vegas. but Michael is a, a Steelers fan at least until 2020 when we, we convert him to a Raider fan. That's right. Um, so I will guess, uh, trying to be logical because I thought that was a setup. <laughs> yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, the Dallas Cowboys. No. No? Good, good guess. Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Oh, you know what? The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are fourth. <laughs> fourth You've got to right. figure Florida's in there. Uh, actually, they're, they're fifth behind. They're fifth behind their Florida uh, mates, Jacksonville. Number one for the most arrests over the last nineteen years. Are you ready, Raiders fans? The Denver Broncos. Yeah, the wow. donkeys. The donkeys. Right. So uh, that is really interesting. Followed by the Minnesota Vikings, Cincinnati Bengals, probably all because of Pac-Man Jones. <laughs> um, Jacksonville, Tampa Bay, Tennessee, and then Cleveland. The Raiders way down the line, not even not even a blip. By the way, the most arrested player, Pac-Man Jones, Adam Jones, ten times 
in the course of 19 years, <laughs> wow. he's been arrested as a player in the NFL, Michael. What do you presume the, the most arrested position player is? I'm going to go with wide receiver. Oh, it is, 146. Ding, 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 ding. Followed by who would be the most, uh, I don't know, who do you think are the most violent players on the field? Offensive linebacker. linemen. Well, that's about not a bad guess. Linebackers are second yeah. with 127 arrests. Third are cornerbacks. Fourth are running backs. And fifth with 82 arrests are defensive tackles. So wow. go figure. How many starting NFL quarterbacks do you think have been arrested? Like, uh, I know Denver had one last year. Well, he wasn't starting. He was a backup, but. That's a good question. That's a rarity. That's a rarity. It is. Michael Troiano, man, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. TroianoVegasLaw.com. I appreciate it, guys. All right, and we'll talk to you again real soon. We're going to step aside when we come back. Travis Vogan will finally join us. Our phone issues are corrected. We'll talk NFL films and the impact on the Raiders brand over the years. You're listening to The Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Professional football in America is a special game, a unique game. Played nowhere else on earth, it is a rare game. The men who play it make it so. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. The voice of God, John Facenda, of course. Facenda, excuse me from NFL Films, and that is the subject of our two segments, our delayed segments. want to welcome with us Travis Vogan, who's an associate professor of American Studies at the University of Iowa. He is the author of the book Keepers of the Flame, NFL Films and the Rise of Sports Media, and two other books on the intersection of sports and media, including on ESPN and ABC Sports. And his forthcoming book is on my former industry, and that is boxing. It's titled The Boxing Film, A Cultural and Transmedia History, under contract with Rutgers University. Travis, thanks for joining us, and our sincere apologies for the long wait getting you on. It's all right. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having <laughs> me. Nice to be here. I appreciate it. All right, so let's let's dive right in um, to this subject because it, it, it's fascinating, and I, I spent a lot of time. I, I mean, I grew up. I'm 49 years old, so <laughs> I grew up a lot watching NFL films, and that's how I got to know the game and how to love the game is through those amazing films through the 70s for me and 80s um when we look at at nfl films as is from its inceptions uh inception ed sable who started it big ed as they call him um he had that fascination with the connection between sports and drama as you say in your book um talk a little bit about the beginnings of nfl films and really the sables and what they what they were trying to do at that time yeah, there there are a few big things that were happening around that time in sports and also in media that sort of shaped and allowed NFL films to happen and flourish. One of them was that Pete Rozelle, the commissioner of the NFL who took over in 59, was really trying to market the league. Um, it's hard for us to imagine this now, but football at that time was actually the third maybe the fourth most popular sport. I'm talking about professional football, behind college football, baseball, and maybe boxing. And Pete Rozelle realized that in order to build a fan base and get an audience, then he needed to do more than just stage games. Um, He needed to create a kind of image for the league that was going to get people excited And so they started doing merchandising, um, all sorts of marketing things. And at the same time, Ed Sable, Big Ed, um, had basically retired early from his father-in-law's overcoat factory. It was called the Jacob Siegel Overcoat Company. And he got this windfall of cash, and rather than going back to work, he decided to pursue his interest in home movie making, amateur films, and he started making industrial films and promotional films for folks like the Bahamas Tourist Bureau and um, local creameries and all that kind of stuff. (laughs) And they realized that the right to film, not televised, but film the 1962 NFL championship game, and remember this is before the Super Bowl, uh, were up um, for 
uh, auction. And unlike rights to televise the game, uh, the rights to film them, because it's not live, um, are significantly cheaper. So he got the rights to film the 1962 championship game, and rather than create the kind of more newsreel, old school, college prep band kind of rah-rah film about the game, he wanted to make it into kind of an epic battle. And they made this film called Pro Football's Longest Day, which was actually based on or sort of inspired by the Daryl F. Zanuck movie, The Longest Day. And they tried to create this kind of um, almost warlike struggle uh, between the Packers, Lombardi's Packers, and the Giants. And that was pretty successful. Uh, not many people saw it. They would show it at things like Elks Clubs and Rotary Clubs and that kind of stuff, and just kind of travel well, around and show them on a bed sheet and an auditorium, <laughs> that kind of thing. And, Travis, I think that's – if you yeah, think – think no, that's okay. If you think about the early days of the NFL, which we're talking – again, we're tra- talking to Travis Vogan, Associate Professor of American Studies at the University of Iowa, author of the book Keepers of the Flame, NFL Films and the Rise of Sports Media – Travis, when you look at that, it's hard, I think, for people today, especially for younger folks who grew up with a much different media machine than you experienced in the 60s and 70s, to think about the NFL being relegated to Elks Clubs on a sheet or on a projector screen and, and previewing these films is, is, is such a departure from what we, what we see today. And, and, and NFL films really was the way the, NF, the, the NFL – wanted to control how its its football and its product were consumed and remembered because that's what Pete Rozelle did, right? Pete Rozelle was a disciple of Walt Disney. He wanted to see a diversification with NFL and look at it as entertainment, not just as a sport, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, NFL Films is, um, to use kind of a crude term, it's a propaganda company, right? It's, it's <laughs> right. a way of creating a very specific understanding of pro football that really highlights positive qualities, right? The, the romance, the violence, the toughness, and suppresses those things that the NFL isn't so excited about sharing with us. Some of the things that, that you were talking about with Michael just a minute ago. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting as well because if you look at the NFL now, and it's, it's sort of, it sort of becomes the victim of its own um, uh, propaganda sometimes because one of the things that Pete Rozelle did as part of your story and in your book you talk about it was to specifically it was a conscious effort by them for example to bring elements of patriotism into the Super Bowl and into the NFL football they wanted to become they wanted to supplant baseball as the country's pastime and in doing mm-hmm. so now you see things like Colin Kaepernick and all these other issues um, because – and people sometimes don't understand. I don't get it. the big deal. It's the national anthem. They used to not, they used to not play it before games. But the NFL, right. even its logo, right, is, is, is a play on patriotism. <laughs> yeah, and, and that, was a, that was probably more an effort that was organized around business and marketing than patriotism and nationalism. But as you know, patriotism and nationalism – are good business for a lot of brands. Um, and the NFL realized that and tried to equate themselves with American identity and really try to build a national brand. Because at the time, again, there were fewer teams. And right. so the NFL wasn't a national, um, nationally um, kind of distributed organization in the same way that baseball or college football was. And so they were trying to create fans in places that didn't have franchises. One of the ways to do that is to wrap yourself in the flag. Um, but you also get kind of the other end of that, where people are kind of debating, what does this patriotism mean? How do we kind of define it? And that's when the NFL has kind of gotten itself into a bit of a pickle with those kinds of things, trying to they, kind of play both sides of it. Yeah, no, they have, and 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 it's it's really interesting to see how how this this operation NFL Films, uh, and like you said, we can call it propaganda. That's exactly what it is. it's pro- it's a promotional arm. What they were able to do to this game and what they were able to bring to the table is really remarkable. And I think at the core of that 
in not only reading your book and but watching hours upon hours of not only their films but docu- other documentaries about them, including on Steve Sable, um, mm-hmm. is 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 just the the creativity that he brought to it and how he really changed the game. Now, Big Ed's in the Hall of Fame, and um, uh, I think Steve should be there as well. Correct? Absolutely, hundred um, percent. Yeah, Steve Sable and, should be in the Hall of Fame, no doubt. And 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 the contribution. I mean, his writing. We'll talk a little bit about it. We're going to come up here on a break in a, in a few seconds, um, uh, Travis. When we come back, we want to talk to you a little more about Steve Sable, what he was able to do, his creativity, how they modeled great films to create football films. And then we'll also talk specifically about what place does NFL films play in the building of the iconic Raiders brand. So stick with us. And when we come back, we're going to talk about that. So don't go anywhere. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. CBS Sports Radio. Hey, this is Rodney Hudson. You're listening to Silver and Black today. Indeed. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on this Sunday, 16 days until the start of training camp for your Raiders. We're talking to Travis Vogan, who wrote the book Keepers of the Flame, NFL Films, and the Rise of Sports Media. Now, Travis, um, we, we were going to play Autumn Wind coming in from the break uh, because that piece of music, that piece of audio uh, was something that, it, you know, for Raiders fans, obviously, it's Raiders religion. Anthem. Yep. It's Yeah, it's an anthem. Now, when you look at the Raiders brand, of course, Al Davis, number one, right? He created that brand. He perpetuated it every all the the goodness the badness of it the outlaw nature of it but how much did did that give a canvas for steve sable to help them build that brand and to help them become the bad guys of the nfl yeah i think that i mean i the nfl films loved uh doing pieces on the raiders precisely because they had that foundation not only with al davis but with the the color scheme, with the mascot, with the types of players who Al Davis would uh, put under contract, and the way that he kind of fostered a culture of individuality, as long as it didn't get in his way. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he he loved uh, representing the Raiders. They really gave him a kind of framework to to let his own imagination kind of run free. And I think the autumn wind is a great illustration of that. Probably the best known um, writing that Sable ever did. Yeah. I feel like along with Al Davis, Ed and Steve Sable don't get enough credit for, for the growth and the popularity. You know, they don't nearly get enough credit for the growth and the popularity of the NFL these days. Yeah, I think you're right. And I mean, the Raiders in particular, one of the things that the NFL, that NFL films did is they were able to create kind of national brands for certain teams. And so the Raiders were one of them as the bad guys, right? But then the Cowboys being America's team, that's right. something that, that NFL Films did as well. And the Packers kind of being the more old-school, Lombardi-driven team. And so, you know, the Raiders were one of those kind of archetypes that they created for um, the league's different clubs. And, and was it Ed that coined the phrase, the uh, America's team for the Cowboys? No, I think it was it was a producer named Bob Ryan who came up with that um, at NFL Films. Okay. Um, it was for a yearly highlight film for the Cowboys, and NFL Films made yearly highlight films for every team every year, and they decided at some point that that would be a appropriate uh, nickname for that team right. because of the kind of uh, you know, their mascot, the Cowboys, the star, the right. kind of America, mythic American elements wrapped up in that. I felt it was funny that um, George Hallis was probably one of the biggest detractors uh, uh, in the beginning because he thought when NFL films showed up, maybe they were spying, basically, right? And then he was the yeah. one that coined, yeah. the, coined the phrase, the keeper of the flame, correct? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think with someone like Hallis, he was there at the beginning of the NFL, and he was pretty entrenched in the tradition. Oh, yeah. And I think having something like a film crew, even though it seems standard now that you're just going to be surrounded by media at a pro game, 
wasn't so much the case back then, and he found him uh, to be a nuisance and maybe unnecessary. He didn't really realize the potential of the marketing that they provided. Right. And I think after a couple of years, he realized, wow, this is really valuable. It's um, growing the league. It's growing the Bears, and and he came to really appreciate what they were up to. Well, and and Travis, when you when you're talking about the, these these archetypes, right? Because that's that's what NFL films did so well, and what Steve Sable. I mean, I, I, I went back and I looked at all of those, those memorable, including Autumn Wind, those memorable verses that he wrote. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really is fantastic prose on its own, even if it wasn't associated with these films. I mean, some of it, yeah, it's a little uh, 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 fun and whimsical. But, but this yeah. man and what he was able to do with something like Autumn Wind – that really was a reflection of his creativity and, and the way they wanted to romanticize the sport. I think that's the word, romanticize. I mean, um, Steve Sable was, if anything, uh, a romantic, and he did sort of imagine football in these really kind of glorified terms. And he really kind of loved the the beauty of the game and the, the power and the brutality and how they all kind of mixed together in this sport and he was an art history major you know his mom was very involved in the arts and um he found a kind of creative outlet in football um that in a way that nobody had really applied those kinds of practices to sport before or at least in a slightly different way you start to get some of these people or some of these media outlets are treating sport in this creative way, like Rune Arledge at ABC and whatnot, but the Sables have a very distinct approach. Well, and you look at the, as you mentioned in your book, during the 70s, the Raiders and Al Davis insisted that the NFL films, when they would do that year-end highlight film, that every player was named or mentioned in that film. Uh, So it shows you the owners quickly found out uh, that these, these pieces were important for them internally uh, and once they got over the the idea that it wasn't going to be negative towards them, that it was actually a positive marketing tool, uh, they got on board. Now, if we look at this, and, and for, for Raiders fans, NFL films and the autumn wind and all of this is so so very vital to the team's history. But NFL films now, so if you look at that, as you go through your book, you talk about the differences. And even Steve Sable said something about this, that, hey, every every kind of dog has its day. NFL films still very involved, still part of the league, still part of the NFL channel now uh, on on cable television, uh, but it's a much different thing, and that's because of us. We're consuming media differently. How has that changed yeah. NFL films? Well, I mean, at, when NFL films started out, this was sort of before cable television, before ESPN. Um, you were only seeing highlights on during its syndicated programs on Tuesdays. If you weren't watching, for instance, live broadcasts, now that's obviously changed, and you can see sports not only any time but any place with their phones. And so it's made NFL films a little bit less vital in terms of its informative functions, right? We're not going to NFL films to kind of see what happened or see highlights because we're already seeing them as the games are going, really. Um, and so it became less vital to the NFL. And so what it wound up doing was kind of being folded more into NFL media and the NFL network. And now it's basically operating in the service of the NFL network, which is more of a promotional slash news organization. Um, It still does create some of the more dramatic stuff, but that's far, far more rare than it was earlier on. It's, It's most noteworthy show now is obviously Hard Knocks, right. which yeah. has some of those kind of epic elements, but is more or less a reality show. Well, and, and the humanity that, that Steve and Ed Sable wanted to show as well, they wanted to show these as people. I mean, until they started NFL Films and were showing close-ups of players behind the face masks, that had not been done before. Mm-hmm. Uh, the tight spirals on the balls, all those things were different. You get a little bit of that humanity now. I, I watched yesterday on NFL Network oh, sure. the, the marathon of a football life, which are which to me mm-hmm. feels more NFL films ish, if an you NFL will. NFL films production. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's 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 something that kind of continues. That's the long form that they have. Yeah, well, yeah. The other and one you that... see that, and those practices are kind of folded into 
sports media in general. And now, so we'll see kind of a, a teaser for a game that's about to be on, on, you know, CBS or whatever. And they'll use kind of a, a slow motion spiral, but all of those things are kind of just part of the language we use to talk about football. So NFL films kind of established this language and now that we have it and we use it, they're not quite as necessary as they once were, which is kind of disappointing to folks like us who grew up really liking those documentaries. One of my favorites growing up, too, was the Football Follies. Um, oh, yeah, those were cool. Those were great. <laughs> now, talk about how that got started. I think they, they said they didn't want to show that because they didn't want to upstage the, show the players, you know, tripping over Goofing themselves. Around. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was kind of B-roll because these, these NFL films had crews at every game, so they were seeing a lot of stuff, <laughs> and they had documentation of every play. And so, you know, things happen that are kind of funny or, or silly. And they created kind of a montage of these moments. And they showed it to the Philadelphia Eagles team just right. to kind of try it out and kind of entertain them because they were based outside of Philly. Um, and they really liked it. And the league was reluctant to have it shown nationally because, you know, it was presenting these players as, as human. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and... Um, but then they became one of the, the biggest hits yeah, and really great. kind of the beginning of, I mean, think about bloopers, about football follies, you know, where would, where would YouTube be? Right. Exactly. And you put Mel Blank and, and then the Looney Tunes sound effects to that. And, oh. uh, yeah. and then you got the wrong way Marshall play and, uh, you know, the, yeah, exactly. the miracle of the metal lands and then the slow motion with the, well, and Travis, be, be, before we let you go here in a few minutes, I want to touch on what Chaz mentioned earlier and what you guys were just talking about now, which is voices. So John Facenda, mm -hmm. uh, talk about his involvement, because I think John Facenda, a lot of people think he's probably a big football guy, but that wasn't necessarily the case. But how important of a piece, and did the Sables, what was their appreciation for his contribution? Well, I mean, he was one of the probably three or four big elements that make NFL films NFL films. There's Facenda's voiceover with that sort of booming baritone. The um, there's Sable's writing, um, there's the slow motion cinematography, and then there's um, Spence's musical score, yep. right? Yep. And those four things kind of combine to create that mythic register, mythic sort of language that NFL film built for the league. And Sam Spence, or sorry, um, uh, John Facenda, as the narrator is kind of driving the whole ship. So he's arguably more important than some of those elements, but he's the voice of, of football really. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that's what was remarkable to me is, is just how it all came together. And that was the thing. It was timing. It was talent. It was a need. Uh, and, and in today's NFL, you know, we see things uh, much differently. And like you said, you study this and teach this, uh, media consumption and media studies um, for NFL right. films. Uh, do do we we're starting? I think as as generations go on, we're starting to understand its contribution and appreciate it more. But have we gotten to a point now where we can look back with with works like yours and others to really appreciate how it helped develop what has become the modern NFL? Yeah, I think so. I mean. Because the NFL isn't just about football, right? It's about what, how, how we understand sports and what we want sports to do and the things that we expect from sports. And one of the things that NFL Films is up to is trying to create those expectations. Um, one of the reasons why we're so shocked by all of the talk of CTEs and concussions and whatnot is because they were that information was somehow kind of startlingly surprising to us. And one of the reasons it was so surprising to us is because we've been encouraged to imagine football in a different way. Yeah, and NFL that, films helped to create that way of imagining football. Um, and that, that spans beyond just the NFL. It spans into sports and popular culture more generally. So I think NFL films is incredibly important not just to football but in pop culture more generally absolutely travis vogan associate professor of american studies at the university of iowa author of the book keepers of the flame nfl films and the rise of sports media travis thanks for holding with us through our difficulties mm -hmm. with the phones 
and just an amazing work. We appreciate it, and we'll be watching the rest of the work. I'm sure we'll have you on again because we'd love to continue the conversation around media and the NFL, so we'll, we'll have yeah, you on during the season. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, nice to talk to you. Thanks, All Travis. right, Travis Vogan. Again, pick up his book, Keepers of the Flame. Uh, really great work there. Also, he has one on ESPN and uh, ABC Sports as well that you should – take a look at we're going to step aside one final time when we come back we'll close out the show you are listening to silver and black today here on cbs sports radio 1140 this is shack for icy hot and i got a few words about pain see pain thinks it could overpower you found the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black this is silver and black today live on cbs sports radio 1140 Here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back again. Thanks to Tra- Travis Bogan. Great conversation on the history and contribution of NFL films to not only the Raiders iconic brand, but also to the entire NFL. And we, because of all these audibles, we're right up against it. And uh, we're coming up on one of our favorite segments. And I know one of yours, especially those uh, out there who love Kelly. And that is, of course, <laughs> both of them. Both of them. Yes, all two of them. Um, is Kelly's Corner. Kelly, take it away, man. What do we got? Well, I got to kind of cut this short, so I'll try to get this out short and sweet now. Um, if you watch sports at all, you saw the Kawhi Leonard signing, the Paul George trade. Oh, yeah. I mean, it caused an earthquake. It, it basically did. It completely changed four franchises in one fell swoop. Yep. And um, I was going to have this whole thing about how you'll never see a trade like that in the NFL. You know, they got five picks two pick swaps, and two starters for one player. Right. Okay? Now, granted, it was they had to do that to get Kawhi and both. So you're getting both players, yeah. which is why the Clippers did that. Normally you would never do that, especially for a guy that just had shoulder surgery on not one shoulder, but both shoulders. Right. You know, <laughs> it's it's just unbelievable to think they could – the. Uh, Oklahoma City can now completely rebuild their franchise with one fell swoop well, because they've got all this draft capital. Right, and but and, like you say, you're not going to see – you won't see anything like this in the NFL. Well, last year I brought up this kind of on the show, the the fake trade. Would the Raiders trade Derek Carr uh, two of the first round picks they had this year, one of like Chicago's number one next year, for Aaron Rodgers and a two? So basically you got a two for Carr and then three – you gave up three – and Raider, like the people that I talked to, acted like I was an idiot, and that's the dumbest <laughs> thing you've ever seen. And Aaron Rodgers is exponentially a more important factor in a football team than Paul George is to a basketball team, and you gave up half as much. Yeah, you know, it's just mind-boggling wh- how how that came down and worked. And now they also have another asset in Russell Westbrook that they're going to trade and spin off now, which unfortunately, because his his contract. With like the last year's forty seven million or something. Yeah, you get the it, you're, yeah you're not gonna get a haul for him, but you're gonna be able to get anything for him and you're gonna have a dozen draft picks over the next six years to completely rebuild a franchise. It's insanity. I think the only thing we ever saw like that was the Herschel Walker trade, well, correct? But even with the Herschel Walker trade the only reason that became such a big thing was because they nailed like every draft pick. Right. And that's the whole thing. If 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 they miss all these draft picks, if they're bad draft picks, we'll look back at this and it's not gonna no, matter. Sam Presti does a great job down in Oklahoma. Oh City. no, yeah. And yeah. and the that's I don't think he had any intention of trading Paul George. But it's at sooner or later it's like if you're selling you don't want to sell your house but if somebody offers you right. nine times the <laughs> listing value of it, well, you're gonna the, sell the damn house. Those, those late draft picks, those 27, 28, I think it was. That's not going to do anything. No, that's why they have the swaps. Right. No, yeah, that's the, the swaps. And, and that's the thing. That's the pick swap, which you never really see in the NFL or yeah. anything like that, to me is one of the most, like, if you can get that, because people just throw that in. It's yeah. like, well, we're going to be good. You're not going to swap our pick. We're better than you. Right. But all it takes is a Peyton Manning injury and right. the Colts are picking number one. Yeah. All it takes is, you know, uh, LeBron, you know, yeah, no, the, you're right. The Lakers ham, did it with hamstring, New Orleans. Hamstring, they got two pick they, swaps. Yeah, too. I was gonna say, and they got that in there, which to me was just they. Well, won't so I get think into that the Clippers trade. got a couple of um, draft picks um, for the Tobias Harris trade. Yeah, the, they did have a couple un, stock unprote- unprotected number one in 2021 from Miami, and then a protected number one from Miami. But in 2021, supposedly going to be the first draft where they're going to be double dipping 
college and high school. So that should be the mo that should be the most valuable draft pick that they've had in twenty years. Right. But people are throwing them around like candy because in the NFL you need two or three stars and screw the rest of your thing because if this fails, I'm getting fired. I don't care about my twenty twenty five draft picks if I don't have a job. Right. Right. And that's where I think a lot of fans they talk about stockpiling draft picks, draft picks. Yes, I mean, especially after the second round ish, you know, when you're just looking for bodies and you take it a chance. Right. But when it comes to impact players at the top of a draft, you you got to go with them. You can't. You're that's why you're not going to see what you saw, right? I mean, yeah. those are the things that I think difference. I think sometimes fans, if they're fans of both sports, which of course a lot of us are fans of multiple sports, you forget about that and how one doesn't translate into the other as much as you'd like the same kind of excitement. Yeah, yeah. and it, it just shows how much they overvalue draft picks, in my opinion, in the NFL, and they undervalue them in the NBA. It's, it's, it's I mean, every great team in the last you know, decades has been built by the draft. So, but, get, apparent, but apparently, remember, Kelly, we are on the show Laker Haters. Oh. <laughs> Not really, because Chad used to work for them. That's what no, was no. so funny. I find he, it funny. He because... used to work for him. He yeah. should hate him worse than <laughs> it. They fired him. <laughs> no, no, no. Can't hate the Lakers. No way, man. All right. Well, that's going to close the show. I want to thank Travis Vogan, Michael Troiano, our guest, and, of course, Kelly Kreiner and Chaz Osborne, my co-hosts. We'll be back next week, 16 days to NFL football and the Raiders. Yeah. Get back to work. You've been listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 a.m.